two different sets of emails, and the ones that were from Hillary Clinton's staff were posted on a new website called DC Leaks. Um, you may have heard of it. It was not the one with the Podesta emails. It was with, oh, yes, it was. It was, I think it was Podesta and some of the other people. Um, but I got calls um, one day from people I know who said, Marion, you're in the hacked emails. I couldn't believe it. I didn't have anything to do with that campaign. I couldn't imagine. How could I possibly be there? And I looked at them. And sure enough, there I was. Um, and I was there because an advisor to Hillary Clinton, a woman named Capricia Marshall, um, happened to be a consultant for Coca-Cola at the time that she was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign. And her emails were picked up um, in the DC leaks cash. And she was paid 7000 a month by Coca-Cola while all this was going on, the emails revealed. Um, so why was I in there? I was in there because I was in, when I was in Australia, I gave a talk to the Nutrition um, Association of Australia. And I vaguely remember that. And it was a very small group, a much, even a smaller group than this. Uh, <clears throat> and somebody said, you know, there's somebody from Coca-Cola who's in the audience. So I thought, of course, there's somebody from Coca-Cola. I had just published Soda Politics. It had come out two or three months before. I figured somebody from Coca-Cola was at every talk I gave. And you know who you are. <laughs> right? So the representative from Coca-Cola had taken notes on my talk. Excellent notes. A plus for getting it dead on right. And those notes, and, and also recommended that my activities in Australia be monitored very closely, and the activities of the woman in whose group I was working, Lisa Biro. Um, and those notes got passed up through uh, the Coca-Cola chain and ended up um, with this vice president that whose correspondence got picked up um, because Capricia Marshall was corresponding with him. Um, so that was kind of fun. And I thought, I'm really flattered. And there is a God because now I know how to start this book. <laughs> It was a gift. It was an absolute gift. So that's how I start the book. I talk about the Coca-Cola emails because those emails not only talked about my lecture in Australia, but they also talked about how Coca-Cola executives were attempting to influence reporters, um, in particular a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, they were feeding this reporter information. They were, um, they called him by his first name. They were on a first name basis with a Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, they were giving him information. They were doing everything they possibly could to make sure he got their side of the story. There were also emails in that cache that talked about their relationship with researchers of one kind or another. Um, and that sort of laid out the major themes of this book, which are how, uh, you know, and I, I hate to pick on Coca-Cola because it's just one company, but they got caught was really what happened. Um, they, they've been caught in several caches of emails and the, uh, and a lot is known about how Coca-Cola Coca-Cola operated, which, by the way, they claim they don't do anymore. Um, when the global energy balance story came out, Coca-Cola was very embarrassed. As a, if a company could be embarrassed, they were embarrassed. Um, and the CEO vowed that they were going to change their practices and they were going to be completely transparent um, and put on their website everybody that they fund. And you can Google Coca-Cola transparency, up comes this website and it's re if you're gossipy like I am you just have so much fun seeing who they give money to um, but they've uh, they list the individuals and they live the list the organizations and they've stopped funding a hundred percent of any study they now only fund 50 percent of studies um, and whether that's going to make any difference we, we really don't know because the basic observation of all of the research that I did is that industry funded um, studies come out with results that favor the funder otherwise you don't get the money again um, and the other 
overriding theme that goes through all of this is that the researchers who take the money are completely unaware of the, maybe completely is too strong, but in general they're unaware that they're being influenced. They say, money doesn't influence me. Uh, it, the funder doesn't matter. It's the science that matters. Um, it has no influence on me. And they get sometimes quite resentful. But there's a huge research basis on that, too. And I review that research in a in a chapter on drug industry funding. Um, because with the drug industry, there's been at least 60 years a very close investigation of the effects of drug industry funding on physicians, prescription practices, opinions on advisory committee, and advice about drugs. And there have been many, many, there's a library of books written about that topic, and thousands, literally thousands of articles over a 60-year period. With food, Despite a lot of searching, I was able to find precisely 11 studies that deal with food industry funding of nutrition, of research on nutrition and health. The first one was published in 2003. The last one was published this, that I found was published this year. They're few and far between. So one interesting question that comes up is why hasn't there been nearly as much interest in food industry funding as there has been in drug industry funding. I think there are two big reasons for that. One is that drug industry funding is measurable. You can look at physicians' prescription practices before and after gifts and see whether they change their prescription practices. And now that we have the um, Affordable Care Act, one of the things in the Affordable Care Act was the physician's payment requirement um, where there's a website where drug in companies have to reveal how much money they give to physicians by name. And for those of you who are New York Times readers, if you saw a few weeks ago a drug researcher at Sloan Kettering um, who did not disclose his his relationships with food with drug companies uh, in his papers, it was really easy for somebody to find that because all they had to do was look it up on the website, type in his name, and 30 different drug companies came up that were giving him money or whatever it was. We don't have that for food. Um, and it's not as measurable in the same way. Um, we don't have the ability to measure these things. It's very, very easy to do studies that say uh, – if uh, you want to look at artificial sweeteners, if they're sponsored by um, the companies that make them or if they're sponsored by independent sources, is there a difference in outcome? Yes, there is. And because uh, Coca-Cola went transparent, transparent, no good deed goes unpunished, um, transparency allows analysis and several Groups of investigators have looked at what Coca-Cola says about its funding and what the investigators say about Coca-Cola funding in their papers and have found big discrepancies. So there's a huge problem about all of that. And again, it's picking on Coca-Cola because there's just more data available on that. Um, one of the things uh, that surprised me about my casual collection of studies that came out with favorable results was how many different companies were involved. It wasn't just big food companies, Coca-Cola, Nestle, no relation, um, uh, Unilever and so forth. It was also the producers or trade associations for healthy foods, foods like pecans and avocados and um, pomegranates and blueberries and just about any healthy food you can think of uh, where these companies and trade associations are just desperate for increased market share. Um, and the only thing that sells food products these days is health um, or sweet or sugar, sugar and health. Um, but if you want, if you've got a product that's, that's a normally healthy product and, you know, a fruit or a vegetable, you want to turn it into a superfood so that people will feel like if they eat blueberries, um, one of my favorite examples in the book is the blueberries and erectile dysfunction studies. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if it were that easy? <laughs> Just take care of that. So I have lots and lots of examples throughout the book of, um, 
of examples of this kind of research and then the press releases that come out afterwards um, and then the headlines that come out afterwards. Um, and I'm hoping through having written about these kinds of things to make people wear uh, more aware that they should pay more attention to who funds a study. I hope that reporters will pay more attention to who funds the studies. I hope that editors of uh, journals will pay more attention to the disclosure statements um, and that this whole system will become more transparent and shed a little bit of light on it. 